Father, we thank you right now for the privilege and the honor of studying your word, especially studying this awesome revelation of who we are in Christ. Thank you for quickening the reality of it to our hearts and let it be applied to our life in very practical and powerful ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the fourth session on our calling to be kings, lords, and princes. And this is an ongoing study uh, based on volume one of our glorious inheritance, the revelation of the titles of the children of God. And we've been focused on kings, lords, and princes for four weeks now. And I'm very excited about this revelation. It's not a future tense hope. It's a present tense possession. The Bible says very clearly, he has made us kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. It will be fully manifested futuristically. But in a spiritual sense, we are ruling and reigning as spiritual kings underneath the headship of the king of kings himself even now. And we need to view ourselves this way. We need to see ourselves as God sees us. And then we can function effectively in the calling. Now, last week, I was actually talking about the close of this age and the entrance of the kingdom era, the thousand-year millennial kingdom, if it does happen literally like that. And I tend to believe in a literal interpretation of the millennial kingdom, that it will be a bridge between the age of grace and the new creation to come. And during the kingdom era, Jesus will reign as king of kings in Jerusalem in a restored temple there on the Holy Mount. What a glorious time that will be. Now, this was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9. We covered this last week, but let's reiterate. Uh, verses 6 and 7 says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. So the more God governs this world, the greater the peace will be. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. So Jesus will come to stabilize the kingdom of David to the highest degree possible. It had been unstable prior to the coming of the Lord and uh, ever since then, of course, unstable uh, in a physical sense and a natural sense because the seed of David, the dynasty of David, uh, was made up of men that were flawed. Some were good, some were bad, but the kingdom as a result suffered from those who walked in wickedness. But Jesus came to order and to establish the throne of David. Now the throne of David and the throne of God merge and become one because Jesus was referred to as the son of David. The kingdom will come to this earth in all of its beauty and power and majesty. And we are told that David will be a prince over all the earth. Ezekiel 34, verses 23 and 24 says, David will be a prince among us. Now that could be a reference literally to King David of the Old Testament, or it could be a symbolic reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the seed of David, the son of David. And the very name David means beloved, and of course Jesus was the beloved son of God. So prophetically and symbolically, the name David may be applicable to him. However, I tend to believe uh, I tend to believe that literally David will be part of the hierarchy of the coming kingdom. And underneath him will be the 12 apostles. Read it with me, Matthew chapter 19, verse 28 and 29. Jesus said to them, truly I say unto you, he's talking to his chief disciples now, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, which is most likely a reference to the new creation, the time when everything will be generated brand new, a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem in the regeneration. When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, personally, I believe 
That includes all of the redeemed because all new covenant sons and daughters of God who are not of Jewish descent are still grafted into the Israel of God. And the disciples, the 12 apostles of the Lamb, will be the presiding kings over this nation that has God in its name. Israel means prince of God, some say, but we do know the Hebrew word El is the word for God. And so we will be part of this nation of God, this nation that rules and reigns with God. And the 12 disciples will preside as kings over us. Praise God for that. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Now, these are not empty promises. These things will come to pass. And you're the recipient of it if you've been born again. Now, in Luke 22, I love this statement because it has such a powerful leadership principle in it. He said, you are those who have continued with me in my trials. In the King James Version, Jesus is speaking to his chief disciples right at the end of his journey. And he says, you are those who have continued with me in my temptations, in the trying circumstances, the testings, the persecutions, the pressure I've been under. You've stuck with me. You've hung in there. You've continued with me. You should never give leadership positions to people that only want to stand with you when everything's going good. You find the people that are faithful to you when things are not going so good, and they'll be faithful to you in the blessed times as well. And Jesus is illustrating that principle. He says, because you continue with me in my trials, I will appoint to you a kingdom as my Father has appointed to me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and may sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, are the disciples, and incidentally, I believe that Judas vacated his position and someone had to fill it. Now, they did cast lots in the upper room to find out who should, and they chose one, but I believe God's choice was Paul, who was brought into the kingdom later on. But they're not the only ones that will be in rulership position because the government of God will surround the planet. The government of God will be installed in all nations. Daniel 7.27, listen to this powerful prophetic promise. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So there will be installed in this world not a democracy, which is a good form of government, but not the best. Certainly not socialism or communism. And we've seen the destructiveness of those political systems. But this will be a theocracy headed up by the king of kings himself. He will not be voted in. He comes in at the will of God. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now listen to what Paul had to say in his letter to the Corinthians. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that the saints will judge angels? not to mention the things of this life. What does that mean that we will judge the world? Does that mean to uh, declare and administer condemnation to those that are deserving of it? No, I believe in this instance the word judge means to preside over in authority. And uh, I believe when it says we will judge angels, it's talking primarily, quite probably, uh, about the righteous angels. Now, there is a remote possibility. It could be a reference to the wicked angels and that we will have the sweet pleasure of pronouncing final judgment on those demon forces, once angels of God, but in a fallen state that have afflicted the people of God for hundreds of years. Who knows if God will give us that privilege or not? Uh, all I know is, thank God, the devil will be bound and all his angels with him. Then in Revelation 2, 26 and 27, Jesus, in that great vision that John received, said, He who overcomes 
and keeps my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. So there will be other nations in the kingdom era. I believe once the thousand year millennial kingdom is over, we'll move into the new creation where there will only be one nation because God did say in, I believe it's Jeremiah chapter 30, to Israel, he said, though I make a full end of all the nations where I have scattered you, I will not make a full end of thee. And so uh, one day there will be no other nations except Israel in the new creation to come. But in this bridge, this millennial era, there will be other nations, other nations. In fact, we read in Zechariah 14 about Armageddon, how all the nations will be gathered together against Jerusalem to battle. And right at the critical moment, God will intervene. I'm not sure exactly how God will execute this. It could be the result of a nuclear war uh, happening right at the climax of this age. But it said all those that come against Jerusalem to battle, this is the curse that will fall upon them. Their flesh will consume away from their bones. Their eyes will consume away out of their sockets. Their tongues will consume away out of their mouth, which sounds like a wave or a blast of radiation. But then it says all those that survive of the nations that came against Jerusalem to battle will even go up from year to year to Jerusalem to worship the Lord of hosts during the Feast of Tabernacles. So it sounds to me like a natural people will survive the Holocaust of the last days. And over these natural peoples who will repopulate the earth, there will be supernatural glorified saints that will comprise the government of God. Now listen to Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. John said, I saw thrones and they sat upon them. And this is not talking about the 12 thrones of the disciples now. This uh, involves much more throughout the entire world. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshiped the beast nor his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And the next line said, this is the first resurrection. Now, let me insert a thought here that is very important. According to Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5, the first resurrection contains those that are martyred during the terror reign of the Antichrist. And those that are dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so if the first resurrection happens after the reign of the Antichrist, it cannot be a pre-tribulation rapture. And there's much more teaching that needs to be given to solidify that, uh, that point of view. But I challenge you to challenge the, uh, the traditional way of looking at the catching away of the church. I believe there's uh, plenty of evidence in Scripture for a post-tribulation catching away of the saints to meet the Lord in the air. Now think of that. There's going to be a government of God installed in this world right before the absolute antithesis of the government of God takes place. The darkest government ever to rule the planet is going to be set up here. Now let me backtrack to Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 and 27. I gave part of it. He said, he who overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And then it says, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And as the vessels of a potter, they will be broken to pieces, even as I have received of my father. Now, this is actually a reference back to uh, Psalm 2. And in Psalm 2, you have this fantastic prophecy about the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to go through the whole psalm. It talks about how the heathen will rage and the people will imagine a vain thing. And that's the network of the government of the Antichrist trying to resist biblical morality and the biblical mandate for mankind, casting away their cords, breaking their bonds asunder, refusing to submit to God's laws, doing it their own way, he who sits in the heaven shall laugh at them, and he shall set his king upon his holy hill of Zion. Inevitable, nothing can stop it from coming to pass. And then in verse 8 he says, 
as if the father is prophesying to the son. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, or the heathen, as King James says. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. When I first read that, I thought, that doesn't sound like the love of God. That sounds out of character with how I envision the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and this great love of God enveloping the planet. What do you mean? Dashing them to pieces like a potter's vessel and breaking them with a rod of iron. The nations, the nations, the nations, the nations. It's not talking about people. It's talking about nations. Nations are containers of culture like a piece of pottery. A nation is a container of culture. It has a governmental system, an educational system, predominant religion, social values, philosophy that dominates those people in that particular culture, a certain language or dialect. And all of the nations of the world are flawed. They all have flawed ideas about who man is, who God is, how this is all supposed to function. And this is not viciousness on the part of God, nor on the part of you and I who will rule with him with a rod of iron and break the nations to pieces. It's talking about the cultures that have been ineffective or imperfect. Being broken and established in their place is the kingdom of God forever and forever, which will be a blessing to all. Now, I'm not going to go into it, but in Luke chapter 19, verses 12 through 27, you have what is called in the King James Version, the parable of the pounds. I may go into it slightly. That's talking about uh, how we have been given giftings, and we've got to be faithful to multiply those giftings while we're in this world. Luke chapter 19, I do need to touch on a few things. It starts out in this parable, a certain nobleman went into a far country. Jesus is that nobleman. The far country is his heavenly paradise realm. To receive for himself a kingdom and to return. He's certainly going to come back again. So he called ten of his servants and delivered to them ten minas, or in the King James Version, pounds, which is a certain amount of money. Um, and said, do business until I come. In other words, multiply what I'm giving you. Do business, do God's business, do the king's business in this world. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man reign over us. Well, whether they want Jesus to be king in this world or not is irrelevant. It's going to happen. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first and said, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. Well done, thou good servant. You've been faithful in very little. I'll give you authority over ten cities. And then the one who had five that he had multiplied his mina to was given authority over five cities. And then another came and said, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you because you're an austere man. You collect what you did not deposit and reap where you did not sow. He said, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. Now, look at this. Wickedness here is not a reference to adultery or idolatry or, or uh, anger, wrath, sedition, strife, things we normally recognize as being wicked. But this is slothfulness, slothfulness over the gift God has given us. I knew you reap where you do not sow. And, you, and then he responded, I, you knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? Why didn't you invest in a ministry that was busy for God, even if you weren't busy yourself? Why didn't you put your money in the bank that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And so the main thing that that uh, parable demonstrates to us is that those who are working in the kingdom now with what giftings God has given them will be given authority over cities in the kingdom to come, according to what Jesus taught. It is possible in that day that both glorified saints and natural people will inhabit the world, as I mentioned earlier. And in Zechariah 14, verses 8 and 9, it says, In that day 
there shall be living waters that shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea, which is the Mediterranean and Galilee. In both summer and winter it shall occur, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. Think of that. What a day that will be. You won't ever hear a curse word. No negative news reports. Nobody's going to be robbing another individual. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Why? Because the Lord will be king over all the earth, and in that day it shall be said, the Lord is one. There shall be one Lord and his name one. There will not be this multiplicity of gods and goddesses that fill the earth now. There shall be one Lord and his name one. And I love this next prophecy. Jerusalem will be the capital city of the world. Isn't it a strange thing that, that Jerusalem now is the focal point of global controversy? In fact, it's called the controversy of Zion in Scripture. That there's a whirlwind of strife and conflict going on around that city. And, and of course, primarily between uh, factions of Muslims that are extremists and and, and the Jewish people that have a God-given right to their homeland and, and the clashing of these kingdoms and, and the nations of the world under deception, siding with uh, the, the Islamic people uh, far too often instead of God's chosen people, the Jews. Now, does that mean that we are anti-Arab and pro-Jew? No, it, it means we are pro-prophecy because in the in the present age of grace, the ground is level at the cross. And a Palestinian Arab or a Jew who receives Jesus as Mashiach, as the Messiah, or a Gentile who comes into the kingdom of God and is born again, we are all equally washed in the blood of Jesus, equally accepted by God, fused into the family of God, united in the love of God, all these divisive barriers in. But until that day when Jesus comes... There's going to be this conflict around the holy city culminating in Armageddon. Why? Why not New York City? Why not Los Angeles? Why not Buenos Aires? Why not Cairo, Egypt? Because the devil knows that Jerusalem is called to be the city of the great king and the government of God will stem from there. And so that's his feeble and futile attempt to stop the inevitable. And it's not going to happen because Ezekiel 48, 35 talks about the city and it says it was round about 18,000 measures. And this is the part I like. And the name of the city from that day shall be in the original Hebrew, Yahweh Shammah. The Lord is there. In other words, the Lord is always there lighting up the world with his beauty, his love, his power, his presence. Now in that day and prior to that day, crowns, will be bestowed on God's people. We will receive an impartation of crowns. Now, I don't believe this necessarily means literal crowns, but it does mean spiritual crowns bestowed upon us. And uh, crowns speak of adornment. Read with me in your outline. Crowns speak of adornment, endowment, achievement, success, authority, power, victory, dominion, fullness, all these things are spoken of <clears throat> by the symbol of a crown. Let me go through it again. Crowns speak of adornment, endowment, achievement, success, authority, dominion, victory, and fullness. These are most likely, as I said, not literal crowns, but they are symbolic of what God will endow us with, what God will endue us with, what God will grace us with, what he will crown us with, in our glorified state. Now, a crown, because it represents victory and dominion, like a victor's crown, if you run a race and you win and you're given a victor's crown, it, it, it uh, implies or it, it conveys the idea that you won over the opposition. And so all of these crowns that God has given us imply prophetically that we have won. We have won out over the opposite or the opposition of what that crown represents. And this, this ought to edify you. If any part of my talk tonight edifies you, this should. Twelve crowns 
are given to God's redeemed. And are we going to get haughty about it? I think not because it took Jesus wearing a crown of thorns on his brow so that we could receive these glorious crowns upon us. So it's not to our credit. It's all to his praise. If Jesus had not worn a crown of thorns, bearing upon himself the curse of fallen humanity, and that's what thorns represent. Remember when Adam fell, God said, cursed is the ground for your sake, thorns and thistles that will bring forth unto you. Later on in his parable of the, sea, uh, uh, of the sower and the seed that was sown on different types of ground, there was thorny ground and the thorns represented uh, the lusts of this world, the cares of this life that choke the word and make it unfruitful. Well, Jesus took all of that upon himself when he was crowned with thorns. He was crowned with the mental misery of the human race so that we could be crowned with the goodness of God above. I believe we owe him an eternity of praise. Now let's go into these 12 crowns. Number one, a crown of glory. First Peter 5, 4 says, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that will not fade away. A crown of glory. What is the opposite of glory? Vanity, uselessness, emptiness. Something that has no glory associated with it is valueless. It's worthless. It's empty. It's vain. But we have chosen those things that have eternal value and they will reach a peak of fulfillment when the most valuable thing happens, the installation of the kingdom of God in this world, and we will be a part of that kingdom. And all the inglorious things will fade away into the past, but we will receive a crown of glory. And that could mean, too, the bestowal of the radiant light that I believe Adam and Eve lost in the garden. The reason they knew they were naked is something departed from them, and I believe that was the Shekinah glory that they were clothed with. Why do I believe that was their clothing? Because they were in the image of God. And Psalm 104 says God clothes himself with light as with a garment. So surely that's going to happen again. The white robes uh, probably are made up of light, radiant light, brilliant light. Just like uh, the early pair had in the very beginning in Eden. And then Psalm 8, verse 5, well, starting out with verse 4, says, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visit him? You've made him a little lower than the angels, and the word translated angels there is the word Elohim, which uh, almost always is translated either God, capital letter G-O-D, or God's. Over 2,000 times is translated God, over 200 times translated God's, three times translated Judges, one time angels, there is reason to believe this is quite possibly the right translation, but it's still up to question. You have made man a little lower than the Elohim, a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and with honor. Now remember I told you a crown is the implication of the defeat of its opposite or that which is in a, 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 opposed to what we are crowned with. Well, what is the opposite of honor? Of course, dishonor, living dishonorable lives and, and having a dishonorable record in your past as a result. No honor attached to it, not living for principles that are pleasing to God, not living for principles that have lasting value. Dishonorable is a word that can be written over much of what goes on in our generation. But for those who strive for holiness and righteousness and godliness and seeking to live by the parameters of the laws of God, there's not only are there laws and commandments in the Old Testament, there are laws and commandments in the New Testament. And when we, uh, when we abide by those laws, we honor God. We honor God. And those who honor God, God will honor. And he will crown us with the honor of the positions he will place us in and the recognition that we will receive in the afterlife because he said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. What greater honor could be given to you than that? Crown with the honor of heavenly recognition. Praise God for that. Then Psalm 103 verses 2 and 4 contain two of the crowns that will be bestowed on us. In fact, crowns that we wear in a lesser sense even now. 
David starts out that psalm saying, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all of his benefits. And then it goes on in verse 4 to say, Who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. So he forgives all our iniquities, he heals all our diseases, and he crowns us with loving kindness. What is the opposite of loving kindness? What is loving kindness? Love taken to the furthest degree. You can love from a distance, but you cannot exhibit loving kindness from a distance. Loving kindness is the great love of God that comes down into your life in a very personal way. And it's expressed in kind gestures, kind actions, kind manifestations of the way God moves for you. And the Bible says he will crown us with loving kindness. Now, what is the opposite? If loving kindness is love taken to the maximum degree of personal involvement in your life, then the opposite of that is wrath. And the Bible said at one time we were children of wrath, even as others, and that we were vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. What is wrath? Wrath is a consuming anger intent on revenge. Let me say that again. Wrath is a consuming anger intent on revenge. That's why the final judgments in this world are called seven vials of wrath. Seven vials of wrath poured out on the human race, bringing final destruction. But praise God, God has not chosen us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, because we have been crowned with loving kindness. If you don't have anything else to shout about, you can shout about that. Then it also says he's crowned us with loving kindness and with tender mercies. So you should confess this, I have been crowned with tender mercies. What is the opposite of mercy? What opposes mercy? Judgment. And if you got your just due reward from a just judge, if I got what was coming to me, if you got what was coming to you, we would be in sore trouble because we would be cut off from him forever. But the Bible says mercy rejoices against judgment. Another translation of that says, mercy laughs in the face of judgment because mercy has been released in our lives. There are two mercy scriptures that I believe are two of my favorites. In the same psalm we're visiting, Psalm 103, verse 11, it says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. And to fear God is to hold him in the highest reverence, to reverence him to the highest degree. And uh, the scripture says very clearly that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Well, how high are the heavens above the earth? Infinitely high. We know there is a limit to the atmosphere around the earth, which is heaven. And the cosmos beyond, there's quite possibly a limit. I don't believe that the physical universe is infinite in its span. Uh, so there's most likely a limit to that. But the third heaven, the dwelling place of God, certainly is just as infinitely high, infinitely large, infinitely wide, and infinitely deep as the God who dwells there. And as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. You cannot go wrong humbling yourself before God and fearing him, which doesn't mean the terror-stricken kind of fear but the utter absolute reverence that makes you melt in submission to him. And then it says in verse 18 uh, that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon those who fear him. So it reaches everlastingly into the past. It goes through all the errors of your past and goes right to the point of your conception where you were conceived in sin and born in iniquity and then right on down into the fall of man and out past that. The mercy of God covers all the territory that brought any kind of curse on you, and then it reaches infinitely into the future, into all future errors, and right into the grave if you happen to go the way of the grave. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, and it penetrates beyond the furthest outreaches of time into eternity itself, and will deliver you one day. 
Praise God. I get a picture of the cross and that. The mercy of the Lord is as high as the heavens and from everlasting to everlasting. It's a picture of the cross. Praise God. I've been crowned with tender mercies. Not just mercy. Mercy is already tender. But doubly God emphasizes tender mercies. Then I have received, you have received a crown of knowledge. Proverbs 14 verse 18 says, The simple shall inherit folly, but the prudent shall be crowned with knowledge. A prudent person is a wise manager of his resources. And if you are a prudent person, you are wisely managing your life. Wisely managing your life. The simple, who are the simple? They're the silly and shallow and self-centered people that fill the earth, who make stupid choices that bring undesirable results. They're called the simple, simple-minded. There's an old saying, one brick shy of a full load, for instance. Uh, their minds don't work right. They don't think right. They don't see life as it really is. They're simple-minded. The simple shall inherit folly. They'll get what they look for, foolish choices that bring undesirable results. But the prudent, wise managers of their lives are crowned with knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Revelation knowledge. Not just the knowledge of acquiring a degree at a university, but knowledge that is God-given. In fact, there's some powerful scriptures that deal with this. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying his great intercessory prayer over the church, and he says, Father, uh, he, he says, Father, this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He didn't say know about you. He said that they may know you. The kind of knowledge we're talking about is revelation knowledge, the revelation of God in your life. Powerful scriptures. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 shows the opposite. Because if you've been crowned with knowledge, that means you've overcome ignorance. And everyone is born into this world ignorant. Maybe not willfully ignorant, but ignorant by virtue of being born in a separated state uh, with no knowledge of the things of God. The Bible says we were darkened in our understanding, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that was in us. So we were separated, cut off because of the spiritual ignorance that was our lot. But now we've been crowned with knowledge. And I love what Paul said in Philippians 3.8. He said, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have, uh, for whom I have lost all things. I've suffered the loss of all things and do count it but rubbish. The King James says, I count it dung that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but the righteousness which is of God by faith. And that brings us to the next crown right now, uh, or one of the next crowns. Uh, next, we're going to the crown of life. Praise God. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been tried, the King James says, well, the New King James says, when he has been approved, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Very simple. It's very simple. It, it's not a complicated set of religious rules and regulations. God said, just fall in love with me. Just fall in love with me. And if you love me, I'm going to crown you with life. Well, what is the opposite of life? Death. Death. And that is the curse that's fallen on the whole human race. And the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Adam and Eve died spiritually, began dying soulishly and physically. And every one of their seed since have been born into the world dead. We're born dead in trespasses and sins. Dead spiritually with a spirit that's almost completely non-functional. Dead soulishly because... Our intellect is marred with all kinds of worldly and carnal and demonic influence. And, and our emotions are awry. Our will is weak. And so soulishly, death has taken its toll. Physically, ultimately, death will swallow us up and take us to the grave. And all of these things cause people to walk in fear their whole life. 
because of death's sway over the human race. But thank God we met the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And that's true in a present tense sense and an ultimate sense as well. Praise God. You have been crowned with life. You've been crowned with the life of God, not the death of the curse. And the life of God that is upon you is stronger than the death of the curse that is around you. And I don't care how many times you get beat up spiritually, black and blue, uh, and you feel like you're about dead emotionally, about dead mentally, about dead spiritually. The life of God in you, this crown of authority, this crown of dominion, this crown of life will cause you to arise above the death-dealing influence. Praise God for that. The next is a crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. What is the opposite of uh, righteousness? Of course, it's unrighteousness. What does the word righteous mean? It means to go straight with God. Uh, it, it means to line up, to be in alignment with God, to, uh, to apply his principles to your life so that you are right in your decisions, right in your attitudes, right in your lifestyle. We can't attain that by human effort because none of us have been right all the time. But there's a fantastic gift. Romans 5, 17 says, We have received the gift of righteousness. And Jesus himself said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you're filled with righteousness, that's not something you do. That's something he does. He's the filler. You're the filly. You offer him a vessel that is submitted in repentance. And he fills you with his own righteousness so that in the sight of heaven you appear just as righteous as Jesus, the firstborn son. And when he crowns you with righteousness, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Why are those two scriptures tied together? Listen to the rest of that passage out of Isaiah. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me or from me, says the Lord. And so the reason the accusations of the demonic world cannot prevail against you is because your past is under the blood, and you have been a recipient of the righteousness of God. Praise God. Number eight, you shall also receive a crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, Paul says, What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And so your crown of rejoicing, the thing that should bring greatest joy to you, is the resulting outcome of all your efforts for the kingdom in this world. That will be the greatest joy. Not what you get, but what you have given and what you have produced through the efforts of your life. Number nine, Proverbs 14, 24 says, the crown of the wise is their riches. The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. What do you count your most important riches? Jesus called them true riches. What are they? Is it the money you have in the bank? Is it the uh, 401k you've got waiting for you when you retire? Or are the riches, the Bible's speaking about, far beyond that? The scripture talks about how God pours out the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about how we have received the riches of his grace. The scripture talks about how uh, God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. And then Paul exhorts, let the word of God dwell in you richly. It's talking about spiritual wealth. The crown of the wise is their riches. If you've made wise choices, you have been made rich with the things that only heaven can provide. The earth cannot supply these kind of riches. The riches of God's glory, the riches of his grace, the riches of his mercy, the riches of his love, the rich uh, who are really rich in the things of God have riches that endure forever. And this is a crown because you, again, are making a statement when you claim this scripture. You're saying, I have overcome the opposite. I have subjected the opposite. Well, what is the opposite of riches? Bankrupt, immoral condition of soul. 
See, we were all spiritually poverty-stricken and totally bankrupt. We came to God with nothing we could offer Him of any value. Within ourselves, we could not earn eternal life. Bankrupt. Did you hear me? I said bankrupt. That was your condition. But then you repented, and this is the grace of God. Paul said, you see the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that though He was rich, for your sakes He became poor, that you, through His poverty, might be made rich. And that's talking about how he divested himself of the riches of his majesty in the heavenly world to assume the poverty-stricken form of vulnerable human flesh subject to temptation so that you can connect with him in his most vulnerable moment, which was Calvary, and the riches of God can pour into your life as a result. And you can be crowned with riches and conquer the opposite, which is spiritual bankruptcy. Number 10, in Leviticus 21, verse 12, the priest is spoken of as having the crown of the anointing oil upon his head, the high priest. He said, neither shall he go out of the sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of his God for the crown of the anointing oil his, of his God is upon him. Now, that was just an earthly high priest, but now every son and daughter of God is among the anointed. And you have received the crown of the anointing oil. It's called the oil of gladness. It's called the oil of joy. It's the presence of God, the endowment with power to accomplish a God-given purpose. You're all anointed. And you have this crown of the anointing, uh, which destroys the yoke. By the anointing, the, the yoke is destroyed. The opposite of having a crown of the anointing oil is, is to be... Uh, under the shadow of death and crowned with misery and crowned with anguish and crowned with sorrow. But we have been crowned with the oil of gladness and the oil of joy that overcomes the depression of this world. Praise God for that. Then I love 1 Corinthians 9, 25. It says, everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown but we for an imperishable crown, or the King James says an incorruptible crown. This crown that you're going to win eternally is an overcoming of corruption. Right now, you're of the dust, you will return to the dust. These are bodies that can be subject to corruption. Everything in this world is subject to corruption. Metal rusts, gold cankers, uh, e everything. Eventually, age takes its toll. The finest mansion will crumble into dust. It's all going back. But in the midst of this cor corruption-filled world that is perishing day by day, you have seized on something that is incorruptible, and you've worn and, be and had bestowed upon your brow an incorruptible crown. In the midst of a death-filled world, you have an incorruptible promise that God has promised you everlasting life. And then finally, number 12, in Revelation chapter 12, the Israel of God, which I believe is comprised of the redeemed of both the old and new whales. The Israel of God is depicted as a woman with a crown of 12 stars, and she's clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and she's majestic in her array. And, and this is a beautiful depiction of the wife of God, the bride of the Lamb, married to the king of kings forever, the queen of heaven, you could call her, with a crown of 12 stars. Of course, 12 represents the government of God, 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament, 12 apostles of the Lamb in the New Testament, 12 doors leading to New Jerusalem, 12 layers or foundations under the city in which are the names of the apostles of the Lamb, the 12 doors over which are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's all God's government coming to a final close in this woman clothed with the sun, and she has a crown of 12 stars. She's going to rule and reign with him, sharing his throne over a renewed universe, a new heaven and a new earth, the queen of heaven, the heir to God's throne. How marvelous, how powerful, how awesome, how stunning your future is because you are kings and priests reigning with him. So how are we going to react to all of this? I left this last scripture for the end intentionally. I believe all the praise needs to return to him because, again, let me emphasize, we never could have attained these things on our own. 
All the other religions of the world are based on attaining perfection through self-effort. Not Christianity. God comes down to your level and you believe. You accept his gift and he imparts to you by grace. Abundance that you do not deserve. No wonder in Revelation chapter 4 verses 10 and 11. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne. And they worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So let's take all of these crowns, the crown of glory, the crown of honor, the crown of loving kindness, the crown of tender mercies, the crown of knowledge, the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of riches, the crown of the anointing oil, the incorruptible crown, the crown of 12 stars, and let's hurl all of these crowns at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and say, all the honor and all the praise belongs to you. Praise God, kings, lords, and princes. But all the praise and all the honor belongs to Jesus. Let's give him praise right now. Father, we just worship you. We worship you, Lord Jesus Christ, for purchasing us through your blood. And you have made us kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.